Hey folks, Andrew Wright from Surefire. Um, welcome to the Shoot Show. Obviously, SHOT Show is not happening this year, so we decided to do a little event uh, ourselves direct and just connect with the customers. Um, the agenda for today and for each day as well, we're going to do some giveaways. So first and foremost, we're giving away X300s, Scout Lights, Stiletto Pros, War Comps, um, and we're doing like several of those. I think there's three each per day. Uh, there is a link in the description of our video, also on our Instagram for uh, the entry form. Go on there, fill it out, and we're going to pull names each day and we're going to give them away uh, live. So be sure to get in for that. Also, we're going to be chatting with a couple different farms instructors each day. Today we're talking with Bill Blowers in just a little bit. We're going to shoot, uh, we're, going to, we're going to talk a little bit about different relevant training topics um, and, and just some stuff that you, you might find interesting. Hopefully some knowledge will be transferred for sure. Um, also, discount codes. So we're doing a fun little thing. Occasionally on the bottom corner of the screen, you're going to see a code pop up. That is a web only pro deal code that'll get you 40% off uh, your order. It's one time use and first come first serve. So keep an eye out for it. Um, and that's not just entering the code, just so you know, you have to check out and actually finish the order to be the one that uses it. So you might enter it and not fully check out with your order. Um, you, have to, you have to fully process the order for that to go in. We're doing a couple of those occasionally through the stream. So if you want something, keep an eye out for the code. They're going to pop up. Um, after we're done talking with Bill, we're going to roll a never before seen video, kind of behind the scenes film of a tour of how we make lights. And it's a really interesting in-depth look at how we make lights. After that, we're going to meet with a couple subject matter experts from Surefire and talk some new products. Uh, and then we're going to end with some more giveaways at the very end. And that's the basic agenda for each day. Tomorrow is the same thing. We got Jared Reston in the beginning that we're going to be talking to. And then on Thursday, uh, we're going to be talking with Matt Pranka from X-Ray Alpha. So that's a quick rundown. I think I hit all the points that I need to. So uh, yeah, let's, uh, let's do a couple giveaways before we jump in to talking with Bill. So up first, I'm going to do, we're going to do X300 Ultras, and the winner is Giovanni Luvano Rico. That is an amazing name. Hopefully you get lots of girls. I think you do. After that, X300 Ultras, Victor Valenzuela. You have won an X300 Ultra as well. Then there's Ryan Akins. You have won an X300 Ultra. Congratulations. By the way, uh, it was mentioned to me that there might be duplicate names. We're going to email you. We have all your information if you enter the form. We're going to email you um, to confirm, and then we'll go about shipping. Oh, I should also mention, each one of these products that we're giving away, the Scout Lights, the X300s, the War Comps, and the Stiletto Pros, we're also going to ship a set of your Pro for, uh, for you as well. Um, it's awesome products. So, Up next, let's do the uh, Stiletto Pros. We got three of those. Stiletto Pro is an awesome EDC light for those not familiar, not to take up too much time on the product, but super slim, really, really nice, rechargeable, everyday carry, awesome light, um, tail cap activation, as well as a bezel switch, micro USB. So then the next winner is Micah White. Congratulations, Stiletto Pro. Then there's Manuel Kitt and Joshua Mayberry. Joshua Mayberry, congratulations. On, uh, on those products, guys. So we're going to be doing some no more polls at the end of this episode. Be sure to stay tuned in. Um, and then if you're trying to enter, wondering where to enter, you just tuned in late, the link's in the description on how to enter for the giveaways. We're doing more at the end. Um, yeah, also, engage in the comments. I'm going to jump in here shortly. So if you have any questions for anybody, uh, be sure to, to put them in the comments, and we'll try and stay on top of them. But, uh, yeah, so up next we got Bill Blowers from Tap Rack Tactical. Let's, uh, let's get him in here. Hey, Bill. Hey, good morning. Good morning. All right, man. How you doing today? I'm doing good. Uh, yeah, no, no issue to worry, man. New year, ready to start training again. Uh, weather is checking, so that's always a good thing to get after. Yeah, man. This is uh, a first time kind of live event for us, so bear with us. You know, we're in the learning phases of, of figuring this whole thing out, but uh, I appreciate you joining us. Uh, real quick, before we dive in to some questions I had for you on like the training side of things, can you give the viewers, I mean, I think most people probably familiar, we've done a lot with you, but for those not familiar, just a quick, you know, 
fifty thousand foot view of, of your background and, and what you do. Right, right, yeah. So uh, retired from law enforcement uh, three years ago. <clears throat> Day, um, 26 years as a cop, 22 on SWAT. Prior to that, I was in the Army for six years. Uh, started teaching, uh, taught related topics, firearms, uh, around 1994. Um, and you know, just kind of continued on with that. So, the primary focus of the company was not related topics to start out with. Um, obviously, that includes guns. And so, now I'm teaching uh, firearms around the country for citizens, not just cops. And then uh, the SWAT class and the tax class are still just every now and then. Awesome, awesome. Thank you for that. Um, all right, man, so jumping right into it, one of the things that we, we were talking about, and this is kind of an obvious one, but maybe not for everybody. Um, first of all, what's your home defense, your go-to, like nightstand gun, or what? What if you're a bump in the night, what are you grabbing? Yeah, so it depends on what's going on. Maybe my defense rifle with a fire scout on it. Typically, we want all turned on to the visible thing. I'm not sitting there with a helmet and nods on the rest of the thing. But they actually, this laser or you can make it on. Suppressed. Uh, obviously, I got to hear about my wife and, and her hearing, so um, that would be the norm. And then sometimes it's a longer Q5 uh, with an X300B on it. The X300B is just a light up typical key bottle so I can transition in the daytime. Um, and it's plenty of illumination for inside the house. So last night was just a pit bump in the direction. So that's what we say. Yeah, that makes sense. So would you say, in your mind, is it an essential thing to have a weapon light on a, on a home defense gun? Man, I, yeah, I think so. They, uh, yeah. I mean, uh, so there are times where I've had, uh, I want to know I've had my Jeff McBlock 43 and my Stella Pro um, doing a commercial here for Surefire. Anyway, um, there's a slow put in there. I always think about um, you know, if there's something happens where I, I need to jump up and I'm trying to access two things, 22 things, um, you know, and, and come up with a light on and do what I need to do. Because if I just have a weapon on a light, I can put the pistols, not the rifle, uh, and have everything I need. And I think it's a less, it's a less problematic issue. And if I'm being honest about how I sleep and how I wake up, I got the best bet uh, for my first one. Yeah, I agree. Um, a lot of there's a whole lot of new firearms owners, some of which may be tuned in. Um, you know, what do you think is is first and foremost for the new gun owners? Is it is it probably get training? You know, watch some YouTube videos. Any suggestions for for new gun owners that are not too familiar with you know tactics? Yeah, I think uh, so. I mean, you can right after all, you can that that knows something about shooting. Not going to take any reverb. Um, I don't believe that there is a situation for, um, for legit training on some of the action. There's a whole variety of that stuff, too, right? I mean, the local range guy can probably have a basic loading gun safety, legal aspects of carrying a gun and using a gun and self defense, um, that type of thing. And so you know, it's a way to get started um, with just a local range. And, as we progress, as most people do, if you're not shooting to get real action and getting better, potentially, then you want to move on to instruction. And the guys you have on this week, I think, and those guys know what's up. So, things like that may be the next step. You've got the case that's kind of dialed in and understanding. Actually, on my personal class, guys last week, I don't really have any. I'll just tell them, hey, man, do you understand? Load number, how to safely uh, drop my atmosphere, range etiquette, range safety. If you can do all those things, and I don't care what your plan will take, like a class of structure from a really competent guy and a new guy to both coach this on the range, right? You just adjust the action schedule and time for you where you're going to be at. So, yeah, I guess the short answer is training, man. That's for sure. So. <laughs> I got you. No, I agree. I agree 100%. I think that's a good, all good points. Um, one of the things that we talked about talking about here, which I think is an interesting topic, um, night vision use for law enforcement. There's there's a little bit of uh, you know it's a controversial subject it seems for some people even even in our industry. Um, there's I think one side which is it can it can be a huge tool 
um, for officer safety, I think. And then, you know, some people say that the majority of law enforcement don't have the, the, the time or the, the training opportunity or funds to be proficient enough to where they should be operating under night vision. Um, just a, it's an interesting topic, and I wanted to pick your brain on what are your thoughts about that. Yes, yeah, so I think, I mean, I, the first time you and I met was uh, about this topic um, and, you know, what was occurring with my team. And what we were at. And I think, uh, at that point, I think we were about four years, three, four years, and trying to be um, really night vision proficient and move uh, it to the utmost of, of its capability. Uh, you know, we, we had spent a lot of money on night vision. And, uh, we had a team members about on the SWAT team was man for it. And that money, you know, we want to use the footage and just take the trunk uh, of the car and take it on occasion. So, um, you know, good courses like going down to Darcy, uh, our guys, and, and there's a night vision piece in there. And it was on the night where the good guys have night vision and the bad guys don't, uh, that you finally get you know, some, some, some payback on those uh, on the role player. Um, and it really illustrates just what an advantage it is. So, from that, um, yeah, my, my girlfriend Chuck Gersberg now uh, consultant came up and listened to his experiences along his AI. Um, you know, what he was bringing to the table, the information we got him. I mean, we, we, we sent guys out to a lot of training. And then I think the other thing, man, the investment in time had to be a so We spent 18 months before we uh, decided we were ready to go operational. I mean, all the mission sets. So I, I think there's a huge advantage to it. Um, you know, there's there is a case law right now that prevents me from doing it any way, shape, or form in a service or search or performance of my duties. I think that that's probably going to happen um, as we're going to start to up. If we end up with different things occurring, we'll, we'll start to get some case law coming down that maybe uh, gives you some parameters for information out to use. But right now, of course, it's the same as a black and it's just the in the dark, and that's it. Uh, you know, you mentioned officer safety, and I think that is, of course, you know, a huge thing, right? Um, Wanted me and my mates to stay safe and, and not get hurt going on jobs. But I also think there's a huge uh, suspect safety issue with it. Um, because if they can, I mean, I, we and you have known each other for a long time. I mean, you're a camera, you're a this guy, uh, you know, me and you had a fight right now in the mass. You know, you, you, you know it all about it. You're like, hell yeah, let's do this. Let's see what happens. The difference though is if I, if I can see, if I can put you into a cave and you can't see it at all, I can see perfectly well. Now I'm willing to get out of the fight. Yeah. And so I think sometimes you take away that vision from people, uh, and it just stops them from doing dumb things that, that lead to use of force. So I, you know, I, I think it's a great benefit. I start to see the benefit of it, and the transition pieces occurring uh, more and more around the country. So I think it's a good thing. Critics are going to say with the militarization, whatever. Man, we did. I'll take it in the when we had Tommy. Yeah. Yeah, no, those are, those are really good points. Um, that's like overwhelmingly positive and for it, but my question, I guess, secondarily would be, do you think it's, it's not a blank, in my head, I guess, is what I'm getting at. I, I still don't think it's a blanket yes, because if, if a certain department doesn't have the, the time and inclination to, to train properly, wouldn't you say it's probably not a good idea? Like you guys are an, or, or, or an exceptional um, department that put a lot of training time in, like you said, you know, you, you, you went out and you found good outside instruction and input on specifically what you guys were doing, and then you had a good uh, spin-up time frame before it was implemented. But if, if it's an agency that's not going to go to that process, do you think it's still a good idea or within certain limitations? So I, that's one of the things I get from that sidebar. Social media guys will mess with I'm a copper, and, and this is what we don't have. We don't have any budget money. Um, and, and I think that the answer is what you can do with what you have right now. Right now, you may not be able to go to a mission set yet. You may not have the training time that you need. But you don't necessarily know that until you start incorporating it into more than just you know woodland based search or future activities or do in the wood line, uh, which is where a lot of team, my team, we get their foot right there. We get four teams. Um, and the only time we put them out is when it was, it was nighttime, and it happened to be a guy that went off in the woods. And then, I mean, in hindsight, you know, how, how silly was that kind of thing? That's just using it um, like it's meant to be used. But I mean, there's been a transition too, right? The GY has absolutely provided a whole bunch of technology and very 
based on the we do the sharing equipment um, that will be successful. So I, again, short answer is, you know, it, 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 I think one of the downsides maybe in America is that the term SWAT can be linked onto anything, right? So a team of six guys that train five hours a month is no different than full-time team training you know, 40 or 50 hours a month and having a huge mission demo. Um, and so you, I guess there are things you can check on the limitations and capabilities are before you start trying to implement stuff that, that you probably should be doing. That's, that, that's how we get that case law. Just so you know, I just noticed here, and it was brought to my attention, I think we're getting a little bit of, uh, of feedback audio from, from your end, Bill. So I don't know if you might want to lean in towards, towards the mic or the computer. That might help a little bit. But there is some, okay. some, some rough audio on your end, and I think that might help if you're a little closer. But uh, all right, man. Okay. Let's see what we got next on the agenda. Oh, yeah. So not too long ago, uh, we did a low light course, or I took a low light course with you um, and some other people here at Surefire. And we were specifically talking about, I'm looking to see if I have a light to show, but activation of handgun, weapon light, X300, X400 style toggle, um, preferred methods. And so, you know, you had talked about a lot of people do the support thumb uh, thing where you're, you're, you're pushing it down for constant on during the course of fire or whenever you're, you're needing to illuminate um, and then to extinguish the light you can you know rotate the gun or you can knock the switch back to the neutral position um, you I believe do an index finger activation to where on your draw you are sweeping that button down um, I started doing that method in that last course and you had told me about it long ago and I had kinda just thrown it out the window as like a, I didn't like the idea of my trigger finger doing anything else other than staying straight and off the trigger, um, honestly. And then B, I didn't think I could reach it consistently enough. And the couple times that I kind of just tried it, I was like, uh, that doesn't feel too rock solid. This, this I'm 100% on every time. That said, this last class, it kind of opened up a light bulb for me or turned on a light bulb for me where <laughs> to where it was a clear advantage you know, on the timer, I was able to illuminate, you know, especially because it was kind of a inclement weather, you know, we had a little bit of rain, we had a little bit of wind, dust, whatever. And so, you know, you're not just knowing exactly where the target was every single time. And the ability of that, or that, you know, quarter second advantage of having the light turned on sooner was a big, a, a, a big help to me. Um, you want to talk a little bit about how you activate yeah, so I, I, in the class, like you're right, I, I teach um, a variety of methods, and then I got what I'm doing. Um, I have heard forever that the you know my trigger finger can be activating lights and doing that kind of stuff, and my thumb can do it. Um, and I think a part of this man is my experience um, in law enforcement, specifically carrying a ballistic shield forever on my team. So now I'm holding a ballistic field in this hand. I got a pistol in this hand. I can't put the field down, turn the light on, put the shield back up, and, and be fluid with it. And so I just automatically started working uh, my trigger finger way right back in the day, and then went to pressure pads, back to uh, the normal switch, that kind of thing, and, and ended up with the, the idea that, well, I, I, when guys would tell me, hey, man, you should do that, that's dangerous for the trigger finger. At this point, uh, at the point I started hearing that stuff, I think it was 15 years into my SWAT career and had been doing it for a long, long time um, with no issues. And then the other thing to consider, what if you're injured, right? So um, not, all, not everything is going to begin with both of your hands working like you want them to work. Uh, and so now I'm holding something, I'm you know, securing the couch, trying to get my wife out of the way or whatever, and I still need the light to come on. And there's a lot of uh, video out there showing guys doing one-handed manipulations of those four varieties, not just injuries, but other things. So now what are you going to do? And my philosophy behind that is I don't want this, right, the, the activation with the trigger finger. I don't want that to happen for the first time when I have to do it versus training to be able to do it. And so I think that helped lead me along the way toward that path. And in the second part, I put on the shot timer, uh, just like you did, it allowed me to ID threat faster because the light's coming in a little bit sooner. I'll see right on my draw joke, which you guys have seen, but I'm in my draw, the light's coming on right now. I'm already getting my light bounce off the floor to help me determine what the guy is doing. He may have dropped his weapon, I want to surrender. Maybe he's playing, maybe he's pressing, whatever the shit like the light. Oh, sorry, my, 
<laughs> I was fucking cursed. You good? It's live, um, man. You're but anyway, I, it is what I, it is. I, I want Mike to make decisions so the past of the light will come on. I think I'm going to end up being better off. Uh, and as you said, it's proven on the shot camera. So I do teach, you know, some activation, sports I found. I do teach the, the shot method where you come in. I get messed with my camera, right? Where you come in and chop the, the button up basically as your support hand comes in. And then I do show guys this with my, the, the tweak I just gave, which is on the draw stroke. I do press it down. I hold it for a moment in time. I don't want it to be a sweeping motion where I'm coming off. Right? So as it gets activated, I keep pressure on it. And about the time it pushes horizontal and I'm making the decision to shoot, I go back to the trigger and I'll work out where I'm any other draw stroke. So I have found it to be perfectly safe. I, have, I know the filter um, switches for me. I don't know if you're going to be on the but those filter switches work well for me. Um, I can't do it on a standard uh, safari land switch uh, as well as no issues. And then the other thing, guys talk about, well, you know, what light should we use and if that. And, uh, one of the things, well, your competitors light switch, uh, a lot of guys like it, and I don't because of the, the one size momentary only. So if I'm switching to weak hand, strong hand, I want to switch that is exactly the same, no matter what hand it's in. So that's why I prefer your guys' switch. No, I, I think that makes a lot of sense. And like I said, I started shooting the same way now. And I, I do think there's a lot of advantages, like you said, not just on the, the timing side of things, but uh, yeah, there's a lot of scenarios that you'd probably have to be one-handed activation. And it's super beneficial to train that way as opposed to have to do it um, you know, when you need it most. So that makes a lot of sense. Um, as far as night vision stuff goes, do you think it's an essential an essential uh, capability or something to train to do white light transitions. Does that is that something that you train on doing from going to green to white quickly? Um, and if so, how do you go about doing that? Are you physically putting nods up? Or are you shooting under the under the tubes? Or what's your method? Yeah. So I, I, I think context is always important, right? And so. Uh, there's a lot of dudes that are using radiation out there, you know, go hog hunting and, and coyote hunting and stuff like that. Uh, I don't think those guys need to be concerned about a quick white light transition piece based on what they're doing. Um, uh, potentially on the mill side, have, you know, talking to guys that are still active duty and what they do with the vision. Uh, I don't think they need it, but it may not be as imperative as, as it was on the top side. And so on the cop side of the house, like there is value in me being able to kick light in a hurry um, so that I can ID myself and the person seeing me can also ID me that I'm not the guy doing some type of you know, um, uh, robbery of the house or you know some drug dealer coming in trying to rob or rip the guy off and everything. So I think being able to turn the light off quickly uh, get, is, a, is it a good thing. Right? And so I, the way that your equipment is set up on your gun needs to allow you to be able to do that. Uh, I think there's some advantage. You know, I gave you the scenario that you, know, you may not want to fight me in a cave versus when you can see me. The flip of that is a compliant person. If I just come in and start snatching them in the dark, a normal person's response to being snatched is going to be the fight. And so potentially to limit that fight, quick blip of white light, I am placed and then kill the light again so that I can move in on, under my vision and maintain the advantage there. Than the opportunity to get off the cops. Um, I, you know, it could be a, a whole bunch of stuff. Um, I think you need to be able to aim actively with lasers and passively uh, with your, uh, your red dot sight. So, uh, my team on the field, everybody had red dot sight tomorrow. Uh, the shield guys all had IR lasers for obvious degree, the primary aiming tool. Um, if they, the answer is yes, man, you need to be able to switch to it in the law enforcement role for a lot of reasons. You know, we Long transition of stuff going on, right? And so the other thing that came up is we had, we're training and doing down officer issues and medical. Uh, the initial thing for everybody was, hey, man, go white, go white. I wanted to see what they were going to do on the medical side. I my car gets pressure, discussing injuries, that type of thing. Uh, and we, you know, they, we thought to ourselves, hey, this is kind of done. Like, we're, if we're being shot at, we're going to solve the problem. In the white light, maybe the absolute last thing we want to do inside of a household. We had to train medical under, uh, no vision training, uh, uh, defensive tactics, handcuffing, that type of deal. But there may be times when it's appropriate to get that white light on right now so that I can assess the injury. Right? I know for an example the house is clear, let's get white on in a hurry so we can start to assess and evaluate what we can do. So 
Yeah, man, you absolutely need to have it in the law enforcement. No, a lot of good points. A lot of good points, man. Um, yeah, I think that's about it on topics that we wanted to touch on. We're right on right on track as far as timing goes. You got any um, you got any courses coming up that you want to let people know about? Anything like that, or at least uh, maybe a website people can check out if they want to they want to see some more stuff from Taprak. Yeah, man, um, th there are courses. Uh, my calendar is filling throughout the year. I'm doing a couple of MVP instructor courses around the country, Montana, California. I'm doing classes all over the country at this point. So if you go to the website uh, www.tap-rack.com. Uh, the calendar is a scroll through. Um, you'll see what the courses are. The ones that I have scheduled right now. Um, social media on Facebook and Instagram. I'm Tap Rack Tap. I need to flowers. I flowers with a bee. Uh, I typically post up next 90 days type of thing to tell you what's coming and around that type of deal. That get uh, hey guys, uh, you know, as much as I can get them signed up. I, my my sign up process is a hot tip for some guys. Because some classes are restricted to LA or mail, uh, you got to email me in case I need to send you, um, you know, ten more courses. So uh, click on the website, click on the contact, and we'll you're off and run just a couple classes. Awesome. Well, thank you very much for joining us, Bill. I appreciate the time. Uh, we'll we'll talk soon, man. Have a good one. For those, yeah, uh, man. Uh, just one last thing. Uh, oh, What's up? Go for it. I just want, oh, my, my bad. I just want to let you know that the human head weighs eight pounds. What's that? The human head weighs eight pounds. <laughs> I appreciate that, man. <laughs> I learned something new today. That's, that's, that's crucial. Thank you. <laughs> Parting uh, words of wisdom from Bill Blowers, folks. All right. So for those uh, on the live stream, we are watching the comments, man. We've been trying to work the audio piece of it. This is our first big live stream. We're, we're figuring it out. Um, so, so please bear with us and thank you for the patience on that. But I'm watching the comments. I see you guys. So are, uh, so is the team back here and we're, and we're trying to sort it out. Um, that said, the next piece of this is, uh, we're going to roll into a cool behind the scenes video, um, from, from the Surefire light manufacturing side. Uh, really, really cool in-depth look from, you know, engineering, our, our turning center where our CMC machines are, testing. Uh, all of that stuff. So really cool, quick video that we're going to roll into. After that, we're going to come back and we're going to sit down with a couple, couple uh, SMEs and talk about some new products and some lights. And then we're going to do the final set of giveaways. We still got some Scout Light Pros and some War Comps to give away as well as some Ear Pro. Um, so be sure to tune in for that. And uh, yeah, let's check out that video. One of the differences with Surefire is Ours are built for people that are war fighters, and we have really take that serious and have done everything we can to make sure we have the very best product out there. My name is William Wells. I am the director of mechanical engineering. So once mechanical engineering has decided that this is a, this is a viable product and we've, we've gone through uh, some meetings with our product management team, what we, we do then is we, we introduce the electrical team and uh, get their inputs on you know, the space claim that they may need to populate the boards that they'll need in, in our products. Once we get the product into the prototype phase, what we're able to do is we're able to take the product and hand it off to um, our program managers. We also um, will hand them off to subject matter experts in the sectors that the product would be utilized. We get this all the feedback from, from our testing, our, our product testing, and uh, what we do then is we move into our pre-production phase. Um, and what we'll do is we'll actually move the parts, the, the component parts, into our machine shop and get, get actual product made. Once we have parts that are production equivalent, what we'll start is actually into our, go into our testing phase. My name is Mike Lasavio. I have been at Surefire for 15 years plus. Uh, I'm currently in charge of environmental testing and lumen and runtime testing, candela testing. Environmental testing is we do a number of tests that are based on mill standard 810. All of our lights go through some sort of environmental testing, but weapon mounted lights are the most stringent. So here in the environmental lab is we uh, take a number of tests that we do to our lights. Uh, initial one is an immersion where the, the flashlight itself is, is raised 27 degrees above water temperature. That's a 30 minute test. Once it comes out of that, that, they go into an environmental chamber where they are subjected to a high temperature rolling cycle. And then after passing that, they go into a low temperature cycle, very low temperature, from minus 51 degrees C 
back up to normal temperature and then back down to minus 30 degrees C. The next test that they go into is a, is a high humidity environment where they do that for 11 day period, but it's a rolling cycle. It's 95 humidity and alternating temperatures between 30 and 60 degrees. Post that, they go into another test where they are subjected to what's called rainfall. It's an IPX4 test. And after they pass that, they go into another immersion test on IPX7, as well as those tests as we do what's called a drop test, according to an ANSI FL1, where flashlights are taken and dropped on six sides. And then beyond what ANSI requires is we, is we do another set of those drops. So here we are in the dark room. This is where we do lumen testing, we do runtime testing, and we check candela as well as we can do beam intensity profiles in here. This is where we do lumen testing. And lumen testing is a matter of how much output or light is coming out of a flashlight. We do that with this particular system, which takes all the light that's coming out of the end of the flashlight, integrates it, take a measurement, call it a lumen. After that, we do run times, which we take the output that's specified by ANSI, as far as maximum output, and then we take that value over to our runtime rack where we take a measurement every second for the time when the flashlight starts to the time that it goes to 10%. After that, we'll do a candela measurement, again, according to ANSI FL1, where we take a flashlight and we put it on a photopic meter uh, that measures in lux, and we take the distance we are from that particular meter and calculate what the candela number is. So the other thing that we do here is we do the calibrations for all of the test stations that are over in manufacturing. For that, we have a NIST traceable flux standard that plugs into the integrating sphere with a specific NIST traceable known value at the appropriate current and calibrate this system according to this output. We then take that value or that calibration and use it in order to make sure that all of our test stations are reading appropriately. Hello, I'm Gustav Bonte. Uh, I'm VP of manufacturing. We at the Surefire here, we uh, machine all kinds of material from aluminum to inconel, stainless, all different materials. The machines we chose allows us to make our product in one setup. If you have three or four different types of machines, you have to train the people on different machines. Here I have to train people only on two machine types. And the machines throughout we have the same control. Everybody can operate each machine. A lot of companies went overseas to manufacture. We here at Surefire, we had made it here, but we had to invest in highly automated machines, highly accurate machines. But this gives us also the freedom to react uh, very fast to market changes, to uh, better quality, to design changes. We can ramp up machines and we can go to three shifts seven days a week and we can satisfy our customers much faster making it here and, and the most important thing for me was to keep the workforce here engineering is about 10 minutes away from here we work very closely together with engineering it to make the manufacturability better we have a very close relationship work very nicely with our engineering department i'm alex sue Vice President of Engineering at Surefire. I oversee all the design activities at Surefire. I think the key to the Surefire advantage is the fact that from concept to production, we design and manufacture here in the U.S. Good morning, my name is Daniel Fischer. I'm the Vice President of Assembly Operation here at Surefire. Here we are doing our weapon-mounted lights, X300, Scout lights, XC models, um, XSC models. Let's go over to the to the warehouse where we actually see our incoming anodized parts actually where the turning center left off and we are actually picking it up from there. All right, in the process of building actually weapon mounted lights and flashlights, we have a vertical lift module which is called the VLM where we are getting our jobs actually released from an ERP system actually based on a customer demand, based on forecast depending actually which one is coming in first. And then we are releasing actually the parts here to the production, uh, to the warehouse. And actually from here we are picking up the parts where the worker, the operator actually can take their own parts and put the flashlights together there. Okay, let's see actually how we do our assembly out there on the production floor. In a general process actually, I mean, we are 
getting the PCB in there. We know actually the layout from engineering, so everything is done there. We are getting the parts out here. We are putting a solder paste on it, a very thin layer of solder paste over here. We are getting the, the bill of material to the machine. So we know actually what kind of a resistor goes on it, IC goes on it, what kind of a chip goes on there. The machine knows actually where to place it on the board. We are picking up the parts with the machine. Everything gets placed on, on it, on a wet paste, on a solder paste. Later it goes into the reflow oven actually, where we reflow everything. And after the reflow oven actually, we are doing a quality check. Everything actually gets inspected 100% here to make sure actually that all of our main components like the PCBs, I mean, which is the brain of the, the flashlight, I mean, that's the heart of the flashlight, I mean, that's where we are putting a lot of efforts in there. We are doing the CPU boards, the power boards, and everything actually gets tested over here for the correct layout, for the correct parts, for the integrity of the check, for the correct solder actually that the soldering is done correctly everything is done here in-house at, at Surefire. In the next assembly process actually for every weapon mounted light, for every handheld lights actually we have a reflector portion actually in there, a reflector or a TIR portion actually in here. A TIR is a total internal reflector which projects the beam out there so you have a really nice tight beam together so you have all of the candelas when you what you want to get out of it and you can also see I mean very nicely in the far distance what we are doing here actually we are checking actually the TIR lens that actually it's perfect we don't have scratches on it we don't have smudge on it or we don't have fingerprints on it after we did our brain assembly actually over there which I'm referring actually to a CPU board and the power boards of course we also need the LED assembly which of course with the power board and the CPU board we actually we need to drive our LEDs so we have a light coming out on the other side. This one is called a metal core board. We are using nowadays, we transferred pretty much like everything from aluminum over to a more expensive one, which is a copper board. But of course, copper has a better heat transfer, which actually transfers the heat much better to our heat sinks. And of course, the heat sinks transfers actually the heat outside to the environment and actually transfers the heat away from the LED. For the whole operation actually here at Surefire, we have always our quality checks actually in there, where the operator actually is checking the parts 100%. It's developed between manufacturing and actually in engineering. Part of the role here in engineering is for me is to determine what type of technology that we can focus on, what's new in the industry, how to implement it into our product. So we're always striving to be the forerunner in technology. As such, we spend quite a bit of time researching uh, new technology, what the advantages are, what the disadvantages are, what it can bring to consumers, to the military, to law enforcement. We strive to make the most technically advanced products as we can. The parts to the specs, I mean, a lot of times is actually we are putting the boards together. We are checking actually the output already, the, the power output actually. So we see the voltage, we see the amperes actually what's coming out. And all of the things are dictated by our OAWs, which is an operation analysis worksheet. The worker goes step by step through the assembly process. And then afterwards, actually, if there's a quality check on there, we have different type of fixtures. And with the fixtures, actually, we are checking actually the parts here 100%. Since we followed through all of the steps during the assembly process, I mean, from the CPU board to the power board, stacking the boards together, putting the conformal coding on, on it, do all of the quality checks actually between it. Here are we on the final assembly of the head assembly, which is the most valuable nowadays in an assembly operations, in a flashlight, in a weapon mounted light. We have the heat sinks, we have the LED assembly actually in here. We have the stack board actually in here, and then we also have the TIR lens together. For here, we are putting the TIR lens together with the heat sinks, and then we have a final bezel assembly, which goes either on a flashlight, can go on a, on a weapon mounted light, depending on the configurations, and then we are putting it together, or we are mating it together actually with the flashlight body accordingly what the customer needs is. We are trying always in all of our operations actually from the stack boards actually what we are doing is a conformal coding process. We try to build up as much as we can and do the, an operation actually in one stage so we don't have to pick up the parts several times. Inside these machines we have the six axis robot. A six axis robot can articulate the parts anywhere, orientate the parts anywhere we want to orientate the parts. 
we engrave, I mean, highly complex engravings like an XVL, for example, an X400. I mean, everything is assembled to the top level and will be engraved actually afterwards in the top level as well. Again, here you can see like a KE head, which would go to the head assembly operation. I mean, we, we see here the marking actually a KE2. We are putting our barcodes actually on there, which is afterwards important for us as well, because at the end we do a final check where we are reading actually the barcode actually in there, which has a serial number on it. And actually the serial number actually is merged together with the light output. But at the end, what the customer sees, it's the light output. And that's what we promise here at Surefire. What we, what we promise, what you will see on lumen output, that's what we are checking actually here at our final step. Again, we have the head assembly. We also actually have the barcode actually, which we saw during the engraving process. And in the end, we are doing a check where we check the lumen output. The operator actually combines the, the work order together actually with the serial number. He puts it in a, in a sphere and actually in the sphere actually we are measuring the lumen output. We are collecting all of the data, which is also like for us important. I mean to see actually that we have a consistent light output during the whole, uh, uh, during the whole process. And then it goes further and we are building it up actually in the final packaging operation. The light goes into the boxes. We checked it during the whole process, all of the quality checks. The lumen output was correctly. It goes in a end, end box where we have here like the, the nicer assembly boxes. We have clamp packs, we have poly bags, we have craft boxes. After everything is assembled and in the box, then it goes over to the shipping department. Lastly, we are here actually in the finished warehouse where we house all of our final products. And from here, we are shipping all of the parts around the world. Hey folks, welcome back. Um, been watching your comments. Hope you enjoyed that video. Look behind the scenes. We've never really shown you know, a full tour like that. So we were really excited to give people a kind of glimpse behind the scenes and, and hopefully what, you know, a better understanding of what makes us, us as far as the uh, the quality and whatnot. Um, I'm sitting here with Jeremy Rosenberg, who's our Vice President of Sales and Marketing, and George Serengelis, um, who's our Director of Product Management. We're going to pick their brains on some product stuff in just a second. Um, but real quick, there was some comments asking uh, two things about the giveaways and also about the promo codes. So to reiterate, we're going to do uh, some more giveaways at the very end of this video to sign up. There is a link in the description. If you're um, on Instagram, there's a link in the, in the bio on our Instagram account. Fill out your information and we're going to draw some more names um, to give away. Up next, we have Scout Light Pros and some War Comps. Uh, and each one of those winners is going to get some Ear Pro from us as well. Also, intermittently, on the bottom of your screen, you're going to see a promo code. Those are one-time use only, website only. So you can't call in with those. you got to go on our website. You have to fully check out, seal the deal. To, to make it work, which meaning there could be two people that use that code and they're checked out, but they're not going to finish running the order. The guy that runs it first is going to get it first. Um, and they're one-time use only, so as soon as it's, it's used, it will be no longer effective. You'll, you'll, you'll try to enter it and it will not work. Um, so just be on the lookout for those. They're 40% off, um, and that applies to just about everything except for uh, batteries. We have a very small margin on batteries. Um, due to the fact that we never wanted that to be a barrier of entry for our flashlights. One of the big you know, revolutionary things was getting our lights smaller and brighter, and the 123s were a big component of that. And so we were trying to reduce the cost as much as possible to not have them be a barrier for entry for our customers. So we don't really have much margin on those, so therefore that discount doesn't work on our batteries. But everything else you should be good to go on. Uh, and just keep an eye out for those codes as they pop up. All right. I'm doing a lot of talking. <laughs> you got this. <laughs> <laughs> All right, uh, Jeremy and George, um, we got some new products. Not a whole lot this year. Obviously, um, the industry's been going crazy. Uh, a lot of demand right now. So I think we're doing everything we can to kind of try and catch up as far as our back orders go. Scout lights, X300s, just about everything are selling like crazy. Um, what are we doing to, to catch up? Yeah, I mean, as you said, you know, our first number one priority is to meet the demand that we currently have current products. Um, you know, our industry has seen more demand since last March than I think we've seen in a very, very long time, whether that's guns, whether that's ammo, or in our case, accessories. Mm -hmm. And, uh, 
you know, for us, it's always a balancing act. We want to do, you know, we want to make sure that we're uh, pushing out as much product as we can. So, you know, we're adding machines where we're cap able to. Uh, we've added, you know, second and third shifts mm -hmm. where we're able to. Um, we've also, you know, improved our relationship with our vendors and improved our, uh, our all the way up our supply chain. So mm -hmm. I just want everybody to know that we're doing everything we can. We know you guys are waiting. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, we're pushing X300, we're pushing Scout Lights, we're pushing Pro Comps, all of those out um, as, as quick as we can. And, and we're ramping up and uh, we're going to continue to drive uh, drive the supply. So. Yeah, I think that's a yeah really important message to convey because, I mean, I see it all the time on the comments on social. People are like, hey, man, when are you going to make more war comps? When are you going to make more Scout Light Pros? When are you going to make... Man, we are cranking them out yep. uh, in, in, in higher volume than, than almost ever. And we're buying more machines to do more, running three shifts. So well, we're doing we, our best to catch up. Um, yeah, I mean, we've shipped more product. We shipped more product last year than we have since 2013 yep. in any year. Yeah, so, yeah. I mean, we've done everything we can. Yep. We're continuing to drive efficiencies, and we're continuing to uh, improve our output. Yeah, yeah. On that note, George, um, you know, we a lot of products that we're going to launch kind of got pushed back because we're focusing on trying to catch up with the stuff we make right now in the backlog. Um, so, you know, unfortunately, not as much new stuff, just straight up, guys, not as much new stuff launching this year. Um, but we do have a couple new things uh, on, on the light side and then also on the suppressor side that we're going to talk about tomorrow. So for right now, you want to talk about the, the new Master Fire Pro? Yeah, so we, we have the new Master Fire Pro. Basically, it's a, a takeoff of the Legacy series that we've had out. And most people are familiar with that because it's open top. Yep. It'll accommodate a suppressor, which is really one of the, the unique features of the Master Fire Pro, mm -hmm. along with any type of a uh, an optic that you put on the slide. Mm -hmm. um, as long as you can attach the weapon light to your weapon, it'll fit this platform. There are a few that won't fit, like a, a G40 from Glock, mm -hmm. a little bit big, uh, but they're far and few between that won't work with the Master Fire system. So now we've incorporated uh, a leg strap, as yep. you see there. Uh, the model I'm holding here is left hand, uh, and it's shown with a cover on it without so the leg strap. That right there is a big deal because, you know, for a while people have been asking for a left-handed model. When are you going to launch a left-handed Master Fire? You know what I mean? And so that's a big change as well for this second version is now there's a left-handed available. Yeah, this completes the system. So now it, it's truly a holster system now. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> With the left-hand option, we cover you know both sides of the spectrum there as far as shooters go. Uh, and, and getting back to the cover, if there's no need for a suppressor and you want a little more security, if, if you want the, the weapon to be uh, cleaner. Less, less visible, cleaner, yep. um, that's what the cover's for. And you'll notice there's a rail built up on here. We're working on some accessories as well for this. Yep. So you could attach uh, a, a molly pouch or tourniquet, tourniquet a light or whatever it is that you want to attach to it. It'll be it'll be basically that's cool uh, compatible for for that platform. And this cover for those that so again the cool one of the cool things about it is with the cover removed you can run a suppressor right yep. with a retention holster which is pretty unique. Um, is it easy to take that cover off? Very easy to take it off. You have one screw here that you remove and then the cover slides off. It, it sits in a couple of uh, slots, so it's so captured. Kinda, yeah, yep. there's, there's four points of contact. Keeps the cover in place. It's very secure. Sweet. Um, One thing know, I did want to add yeah. on this, and that spe specifically to the shroud, is that was direct customer feedback yep. that led to that, to a product improvement. Yeah, so yeah. we released it without um, knowing, you know, with the assumption this would be, you know, primarily for suppressors, for optics, that kind of thing. And as we were getting out there, T and E's with agencies and with other other folks out there, um, you know, that their feedback is what led to that improvement and, and why where that product is where we're at. So. Sure, that's cool. Um, and yeah, you can still remove it, like George was saying. I'm not sure when the feed got lost, but just, you know, you can remove that cover if you still want to run a suppressor, which is a really cool uh, feature of it. Also, you know, it's kind of nice if you're going to have one holster and you can now have one weapon light that fits pretty much all of your handguns as far as you know uh you know cross compatibility goes so you have a railed sti you have a, a, a glock a springfield xd whatever it may be um you know you, you throw the the holster series light on there and it's going to work with with that holster which is kind of convenient yeah and every gun's different so we've also taken that into consideration with how you mount the belt uh, mount to a belt. You can adjust the, the slots here for different size belts. Mm -hmm. You can also change the cant to yep. get the, the, the pistol to sit right in the holster. So 
Uh, there are a lot of little subtleties built into this, including uh, a, a, a screw pattern here to where you can use other manufacturers uh, bracket systems like Safari Land or Blackhawk or G-Code. Uh, you have the ability to just bolt it right on and, and run with it as well. So there's some versatility built into the platform in yeah. that respect. Yeah, that's awesome. Um, diving in next, there's been a lot of comments and questions on this guy. You want to talk uh, about the XSC? Um, so first and foremost, I mean, we launched this last year, um, and I say launch with air quotes. So due to everything that's going on right now, we've had some issues with our, with our batteries. Um, they weren't meeting our quality standards right. So, so we kind of put that on hold, and we're going we're gonna to still continue forward once we sort this out, and we're not going to let it out. Is, is that more or less what's yeah. going on? Yeah, and, and part of it, too, is the whole development process. When you're trying to make something so compact and still provide as much power as it can, there are hurdles along the way. Uh, and we were, it was a learning curve for us as well. Yep. Uh, we've, we've really come a long way with this. We're very comfortable with where we're at now. Yep. Uh, the, the product is solid. All the testing we've done, uh, we're very comfortable with how well the product holds to the weapon. It doesn't loosen. Uh, the LEDs are holding up to the, the, the recoil and the shock and punishment of these pistols. Uh, so, you know, like anything we do at Surefire, though, we will not put it out to market until it's ready to go to market. Yep. So regardless of what it takes, we will put in the effort in the engineering time uh, to get it right for everyone because... Yep. You know, so yeah, that, and I, and I think that's the key message, right? Yeah. And as much as it pains us, and we know that, that everybody's out there waiting for these, and, yep. and we can't wait to start shipping them, um, there was a lot of pressure to ship, um, but we didn't, right? Yep. And because we're not going to release a product that doesn't meet our standards. Yeah, so, yeah. Um, so the battery issue, we'll, we'll get it sorted. I mean, I think roughly, what are we, like a month out, two months out-ish for actually having quantity on the shelf? That's, that's sure. a good estimate, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so we're doing our best to catch up on these guys. For, for those not familiar, um, I'll just give a quick rundown on what the XSC is because it's a really exciting uh, product. There is three models. This is a micro-compact uh, handgun weapon light. By micro-compact, we mean uh, this is the Glock 43 railed MOS version. There's a 48 railed MOS version. Um, Springfield Hellcat has a, has, a, has a version as well of the XSC, and then also SIG um, with their, their P365. All three of those pistols have different proprietary rails, so we have a different light model for each one of those. And I believe there's even going to be some more uh, handguns coming to the market that uh, utilize one of those three rails that these will be cross-compatible with as well. Uh, but the cool thing about it is it's super, super compact. You know, you can see that on this Glock 43, it's not wider than the frame. It's not longer than it, so you're really not losing anything as far as concealability goes. Um, what's the output, 350 lumens? 350 on the output. Yep. Uh, Runtime is about 30 minutes per charge cycle. Uh, the battery does not, it can be removed without taking the light off the weapon. Yeah, so that's, that's pretty cool. That's one of the really nice features built into this. Yep. It's easy to change out the battery. Uh, the charge, you get a charger that has two bays uh, so you can charge multiple batteries. Yep. You get one with the light, and then of course we'll sell them as accessory items as well. Yep. Um, so it's, it's a very convenient platform in that respect. Yeah, and the reflector is a little bit different than, than what we've done in the, in, in the past. It's a parabolic reflector. Um, for the amount people here, especially nowadays, 350 lumens is not that much in most people's eyes, um, although back in the day, 350 lumens is a mountain of lumens. But with this specific reflector, you're getting a decent amount of candela given the, the size and, 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 con, and the power constraints we have with this, this battery, am I, am I right? That's correct, yeah. We, we changed the, uh, the optical prescription. Uh, we, went, we went from faceted to a smooth reflector, and that helps improve candela. So we have the lumens, and in this case here, by making the changes to the reflector, we, were, we managed to pick up some more uh, candela to throw a, a tighter, farther beam. Sweet. Yeah, so rechargeable, super, super concealable. Um, XSC is an awesome light. We're sorry we're, uh, we're a little bit behind on, on shipping, but we're working on, on getting the batteries sorted, and, uh, and we'll get those out, and we'll do a little bit of a relaunch when we're, when we're caught back up with it. Uh, we've gotten a lot of questions, so we kind of just wanted to address it straightforward. Uh, unfortunately, not everything goes to plan, but as Jeremy and George said, we don't want to put out a product that uh, is not going to meet our quality standards, so, so we're on hold right now. Um, Next up, Scottlight Pro. We're going to talk a little bit about that. I think I got one back here. Um, this, is a, this is an awesome product that a lot of people don't realize some of the nuances with it. Number one, that it ships with both an M-Lock cleat and a Picatinny cleat. 
Um, I can't tell you how many times I've like retold that to the same person. And they're like, wait, it comes with both? Yes, it comes with both. So you have the ability, as seen here, to mount directly to the M-Lock rail. Um, also comes with a Picatinny cleat. If you have an old Mark 18 or any type of quad rail, Picatinny rail, or even on an M-Lock rail where you want to mount it on the 12 o'clock. Sometimes it makes more sense for that. The body itself uh, is on a really cool swiveling system. George, can you talk a little bit about that design? Because it's, it's a pretty cool design, and my understanding is that screw, I mean, personally, I, I, I have it loose for here to show the fact that it can articulate and swivel, um, but when I get it, like I'll run it here, I will crank the screw to make sure it does not back off. However, my understanding is you can have it at like 90% tension, so you can still move it, and it'll, it'll, it'll maintain that tension. Is that right? That's correct, and part, part of the design that, that went into the mount system is it's it's actually a, a, a moving mount. There's multiple components to it. So you have the screw, and then you also have the uh, the screw block that is held in place with a roll pin. And there's a slot cut in it, so it allows it to move in and out as you tighten or loosen the screw. So it applies even pressure from both ends onto the pedestals of the, the body. So instead of putting any kind of stress by bending those pedestals, mm -hmm. it's more even pressure by pulling in I on that. And that's how it's able to yeah. maintain pressure. Correct. Yeah, yeah, Even cool. pressure, and that's, that's what allows you to do what you said, where you could, you know, you don't have to go to uh, uh, full tightness. You can back it off just enough to where you have enough friction and, and pressure to where you just, you could put it wherever you want, but it's not going to move on you. It's not going to flop. Yeah. And that's pretty cool. I mean, a lot of people nowadays doing more night vision stuff. Um, if you're running it up to, it's not a problem here with this particular setup, but if you're running it right next to a laser system, I could see having it be at 90% tightness and the ability to move it out of the way so you can adjust, you know, potentially windage or elevation depending on which laser system you have. That could be a big advantage and, and a super nice feature. Um, and then overall, I mean, it just allows you to get it as close in and sucked into the gun as possible, no matter what platform, you know, AK SCAR, any type of foreign weapon system, you can you can tighten this thing up. You know, previously when we were doing RM45s, we were trying to split the difference between the myriad of rail specs of what could fit with everything but still be tight. Now you can make it as tight as possible no matter what. Yeah, and get it exactly where you want it. Mm -hmm. And you can do it with common tools that are that are available in everybody's toolkit. So. Yeah. Yeah, so that's the new Scout Light Pro with that mount. The Scout Light Pro, we have every um, iteration of Scout Light available in that body. So this is the six volt, you know, two battery, standard white light version, but we have the mini scouts, which are one battery. We have the IR scouts, which are white light and IR. All the previous accessories work with them. So remote pressure switches, dual switches, all that good stuff. Um, so yeah, that's the Scout Light Pro. Just kind of wanted to quickly touch on it to, for those not familiar with the differences and the upgrades on the, on the Pro system itself. Um, then to add on that, all, all the switches are compatible with the Pro Series as well. So if you want to have a, a DS system where you have a redundant clicky built in and, and a removable pressure switch, all those accessories uh, will work. So if you have them from an old legacy system, yeah, yeah. transfer them over. If you want to add it in, just buy one off the internet or call us on our uh, customer service line. Good points, good points. Yeah, if you have any questions on this, guys, I'm seeing, I'm still watching your comments, so if you have anything um, specific, let me know. Make a frame for the SIG P320 and M17 with a built-in X300. <laughs> <laughs> you want a built-in X300 frame? If we could do that by next Tuesday, that'd be great. Um, yeah, no problem. We'll jump right on that. <laughs> anything else, let us know. We're doing one-off lights apparently here today. Christmas is coming. <laughs> um, all right. If you guys have any other questions, jump in. Other than that, I think we're getting close to wrapping it up. We're about 1 o'clock. I'm going to do the last uh, iteration of giveaways for who. This just in. I got the sheet during the video break of, uh, of the winners for the second set of lights. But any update on the Scout Vampire more milliwatts? No, we haven't, I don't believe, changed the IR output of those. Um, you know, I don't think there's much customer demand for that necessarily just yet as far as actual milliwatt. Uh, upgrades go. Uh, I mean, am I missing it's, something there? It, we we have a standard, a baseline that we offer in our in our commercial mm -hmm. off-the-shelf product line. Yep. Uh, there have been cases for special customers who are doing special things, where we've made them a uh, little. You know, the, the output uh, has been increased. But, yeah. Uh, in, in in most situations, the 120 milliwatts yep. or the 100 milliwatts that you're getting is is more than adequate. Sure. For for 
really what the, the scope and range of the light's built for. 100%, 100%. See, that's an answer that normally I would nudge George at SHOT Show and be like, hey, don't, don't, don't say that to the film crew, but we're live here, so you just got it, you know what I mean? So try and catch us off guard, folks. This is what this is for. Let's see. When I announce the winners, make sure I choose this guy, send it. I'll see what I can do. Unfortunately, it's not your username. I'm going to read off the actual names for people, uh, people that won. All right, folks, so uh, reiterate, tomorrow we're going live again at noon. Try and get that audio issue sorted. Um, we got Jared Rested joining us, uh, and then we're going to show some other new exclusive content on the suppressor side, some really cool in-depth looks on how we make suppressors. Um, and then we got Barry Duke joining us to talk specifics on suppressors. So have your questions ready if you have any specific suppressor questions. What, you know, if you have a certain rifle and you're looking for the perfect can, let us know and we'll, and we'll see if we can answer all your, all your questions there. Doing more giveaways tomorrow, more X300s, um, Scout Lights, Stiletto Pros, um, War Comps. We're doing all that as well. Be sure to join in and we're going to do some more promo codes uh, also. So the winners for today, and by the way, so this coming up, these first three are for uh, War Comps. Bernard Erheil, is that how you'd say that? That's good. Looks Better good. than I would have done. <laughs> <laughs> Bernard Erheil, congratulations. You just won a War Comp. In 556, um, Ritsuki Miyazaki, you just won a war comp. And Jesse Rosal, you just won a war comp. Then for Scout Light Pros, I have Jiwon Kim, Quint Quintin Hanjin, and Ruri Perez for Scout Light Pro. So congratulations, nice. folks. Obviously, just so you guys know, all ITAR uh, and all that stuff applies. If we don't, um, if we can't fulfill these obligations, we'll get you a consolation prize and we'll redraw for those tomorrow. Um, any questions, jump in the comments tomorrow. We look forward to having you back. Again, it's our first time kind of doing this, so bear with us for any issues. And thank you very much for joining us. Uh, we'll see you tomorrow.